Um, if you've heard me preach more than a couple times, you know that I was an English major in college, right? Right? I was an English major because I could not stand math. Never liked math. Especially when I was in Cockeysville, what used to be called junior high school. And Mr. Dittmar was my math teacher. Did anybody else have Mr. Dittmar ever? He wrote on the board like a typewriter. And I never hated anything more than Terry go to the board because I had no idea what he wanted from me. And he was great at saying, just picture a trash can in the corner on fire. What do you do? Haven't you seen this problem before? And I'd say, I don't care. Because, you know, it was about algebra. X, Y, and N, I didn't care about X, Y, or N. Now, if he had said, one day you will be a United Methodist pastor serving a congregation, you'll have a chicken dinner, you can get 45 chicken breasts at the Giant for $5.99 a pound, 16 chicken breasts at Wise Markets for $1.29 a pound, and 38 chicken breasts at wherever for another. I could have done that. But X, Y, and N, I didn't give a hoot about it. And he'd say, it's just like deja vu, Terry. And I'm thinking, deja vu, I don't care. I hope you saw some deja vu in the lesson we just read. Because the disciples, this is the third time they've seen Jesus in John's Gospel after his resurrection. Last week we talked about who last week? When he appeared to Thomas. Very good. He appeared to Thomas after first appearing to the disciples when they were locked away in fear of the Jews. So now they've gone back to fishing. And there are some things that should have alerted them that this was Jesus coming back to them one more time. Because what do we see here? They're at the Sea of Tiberias, which is also known as the Sea of Galilee, Lake Genesaret. Then we see that Simon Peter was there with Thomas called the twin and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. We haven't heard of Nathaniel since the disciples were called in John's Gospel. And what did you hear about Cana of Galilee? What happened there? What happened in Cana? Mark knows. He went to seminary. Somebody else tell me. The wedding where Jesus turned water into wine. The first not of his miracles, according to John, but the first sign, a sign of abundance. Then what else do we see here? They go fishing. They get into the boat, but they fish all night and catch nothing. Where have they seen that before? And then suddenly someone shows up, stands on the beach. They don't know who it is. He says, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered no. And he said, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. They cast the net out on that side. What happens? A miraculous catch of fish. Another sign that they've seen before. And then John says to Peter, it is the Lord. And Peter hears that it's the Lord. He puts on some clothes, for he was naked, jumps into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about 100 yards off. They go ashore. There's a fire. And what is Jesus fixing for breakfast? Fish and Fish and bread, where have we seen that before? In John's Gospel, there is no institution of Holy Communion. There's no Eucharist. What does he do the night before at the dinner? He washes their feet. He feeds them. But we don't hear about water that became wine becoming the blood of Christ. We just hear that he washed their feet. Most biblical scholars think that what became the Eucharist, or the great Thanksgiving, what became Holy Communion in John's Gospel, was that feeding of the multitude with the fish and the bread, and Jesus is feeding them again. There's one last thing here that they said in this story that we only hear in one other place in Scripture, and that is that he cooked on a charcoal fire. might not seem like a big deal, a charcoal fire as opposed to any other fire. The only other place you hear of a charcoal fire is when Peter is warming his hands the third time he gets ready to deny knowing his Lord. Lots of things should have tipped them off that this was something big. Then we have that time after they finish eating. Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. I've told you this before. Son of John was his last name, scripturally. We didn't have names like we have now. Simon, son of John. Did you ever have your mother call you when you're in trouble? Use all your names. This was Terry, Susan, Kofi. I'll get in here. How many of you ever heard that? The full name followed by the middle name followed by the last name. Got some people out there admitting it. Why three times does he ask him the same question? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Because three times Peter had denied him. Sometimes we think this is Jesus sort of giving Peter a little bit of a 
a little nudge, a little guilt, a little Simon, son of John, look what you've done to me. But I don't want us to look at it that way. I want us to look at us at what it really is. Because what does he say when Jesus says, do you love me? And he says, you know I love you. What does Jesus reply to him? It's not a rhetorical question. You just heard it. What did you hear? Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. Feed my sheep. Care for my people, which is a call. It's a call. Just as Jesus had called them originally in the first part of John's gospel to leave their fishing behind and fish for people, he's calling them again. You don't call someone that you're going to give it the business to. He's not rubbing it into Peter. He's not making him feel bad. He is saying, whatever you have done, whatever you have done wrong, whatever you've screwed up, whenever you've hit the wall, whenever you've just really stepped in it, I am there with grace sufficient for every need. So for every sin of Peter, every denial of Peter, there is grace and there is call. Now the lectionary is sort of weird after Easter. We sort of bounce all over the place, especially the year that we're in John's gospel. John is not my favorite gospel to preach because Jesus says stuff and the disciples go, what? The pastors who preach go, huh? Because John sort of goes on and on and on, but this one is so powerful to me. This story is such an incredible story because I too have felt called. I too have made mistakes. I too have stepped in it and messed up. And I have found grace equal to every need. And I am called again and again and again. Sometimes I feel like I should be recalled in the sense that your car gets recalled, but no, I'm called again and again and again. It's a story of call and affirmation. Like I said, this comes out of sequence here because next week, not only is it Mother's Day, it's Mother's Day in America, in the scriptural calendar, the liturgical calendar, next week is what we call Good Shepherd Sunday, where we look at the 10th chapter of Jesus' gospel, where he is called to be the shepherd of the sheep. He says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. And what is he asking Peter to do? But to step up and take over his ministry. You don't do that to someone that has failed you, that you're done with. You do that to someone that you trust someone who will go forward for you. And Peter does. We don't know the fate of Peter ultimately from scripture, but we know from tradition that he was crucified himself eventually because he spoke out powerfully for his Lord. When we get to the Acts passages, and there is no Pentecost for John other than when he spoke to those disciples in the room, he breathed into the Holy Spirit into them. He said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. Jesus is giving them the power and authority to act on his behalf in the world. Not just them, but us. Just, not just them, but us. Each person here who bears the name of Jesus Christ has been given a new identity in Christ. You're not going to just fish for fish anymore. You're going to fish for people. You're going to be given the sheep of his pasture to pasture and to care for. The word pastor really is just translated as shepherd. I live in Reisterstown and there is a Hispanic congregation there and it's like, it's called the Iglesia del Bueno Pastor. It is the Church of the Good Shepherd. Not the Church of the Good Pastor, the Church of the Good Shepherd. And you are shepherds of the sheep. We're called to tend and we're also called to be fed. We're not going to have fish and bread this morning. We're going to have some cake later, but right now we're going to have the lifeblood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who turned water into wine, does become the fruit of the vine for us. He becomes the new lifeblood in us and the bread of heaven. So as we come forward this morning, you're not going to come forward. What am I saying? I did yesterday. I went to a wedding yesterday. I had communion with real bread handed to me by a human being. It was an amazing experience for me. Because I miss you coming forward. I miss being able to put the bread in your hands. But however we receive it, whether it's that little wafer in the little cup, or whether it's the bread of a loaf, it's the bread of life for us. So when you share it this morning, I want you to hear Jesus saying to you, whatever your full name is, if you love me, feed my sheep and follow me. And know that wherever you follow, he will go with you. He will go beside you, he will go before you and behind you, and he will care for you as he's cared for his disciples all these years. To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Would you, as you feel comfortable, stand and join in singing.